Okay, everyone. This, is, this talk is titled, The Twisting, Turning, Narrow Road That Is Security. So if that's not what you're looking for, now's the time to make your way out the back door. Um, our speaker today is uh, Casey Schorfler, and he has worked on Unix kernels in the 1970s through the 1990s. He has implemented access control lists, mandatory access control, extended file system attributes, X11 access controls, network protocols, and more audit systems than is really healthy. His involvement in Linux began with the Linux security module work at the turn of the century, introducing SMAC LSM in 2007. Casey is reworking the LSM infrastructure to support multiple concurrent modules. He has spoken at LCA five times, OLS and many other venues. So can you put your hands together and welcome Casey here to this morning. Thank you. Uh, is the mic working? I the acoustics here are such that I can't tell. Okay, great, I got the thumbs up in the back. We're all good. Thank you very much, thanks for coming today. Hope I um, put a little bit of entertainment into your, um, into your day. Uh, this is my favorite part of the presentation because this is the part where I forget my slides. It just all goes out, of my, out, my, out my ears and I have to start faking it from here. So, uh, hi, I'm Casey Sauer, as um, my kind introducer here has already covered all this. I think I can move on to the next slide. So there was a time before we had security. It was a really great time. Um, whoop. You got to use the computer all by yourself. All 4K of it. You know, all all you know, 32 instructions per second. Um, but it was yours, you got to use it, and you didn't worry about security. You didn't have to. Biggest reason you didn't have to do that is because if you could afford one, you could also afford guards. <laughs> this was really handy. It's like you didn't have to worry about it. You just did your computing, and again, you know, your computing, your yeah, yeah, calculating just about anything took all day. Um, so these guys could just stand up there and, and guard for you. But then, then we had a minor change in the way we used computers. Computers got fast enough that you could, they could actually do two things at once. And we introduced this, thing, this concept called time sharing. Time sharing was really great, because now uh, we could get more people using computers because we could share them. And so we'd all sit around in the computer room um, on, on teletypes uh, with paper that came out of them. They were, they were really special. Um, but you'd work with, with your ten, 10 favorite colleagues on the same computer, and every now and then somebody would shout out, who's doing, you know, who's hogging the CPU? Or, hey, could somebody free up a couple of disk blocks? Yeah, all kinds of great things like that. So we had sharing here. Now, we're, now this is great. The problem with sharing, though, or, well, the problem with time sharing, uh, is that guards don't work anymore. Yeah, you can have all the guards you want, and it's the guy over there on that, the other guy on the computer who's looking at your stuff who shouldn't be. So now we've got a problem here. We've got to implement access. We've got to do something about this problem that even though, of course, yeah, we're all colleagues here, sometimes I don't want you looking at all my, all my data, all my stuff, seeing what I'm doing. Government, turned out, had as much of a problem with this as anybody else. In fact, uh, depart, depart, defense departments are notoriously um, finicky about how data is shared. In the United States, we have a, de had a, have a Department of Defense, and they discovered that they were the biggest, um, you know, by dollar, biggest consumer of computers in the world. They were kind of proud of this. They said, hey, yeah, we're really state of the art. We spend more money on computers than anybody. And somebody said, yeah, you're right. You know why? Because every computer you buy, you put security requirements on. And each time you do this, you come up with new security requirements. And the people who sell computers charge you five times as much per computer as they charge everybody else, because you have to have security. Well, said the federal government, that's not very good. We kind of like cheaper. So we're going to come up with a single specification for what security should be, and we'll have everybody implement this, that specification and we'll all be happy. And that led to what we called the Orange Book era. Now, anybody want to guess why they call it the Orange Book? It was printed in an orange book. 
Very good. Very good. I, I like an astute audience, or at least an old one. <laughs> um, that's right. They, they put out um, their set of security criteria under a bright orange cover. This one's actually quite faded because it's actually quite old. Um, and it was marvelous because you could actually read this book and understand what the security requirements were. You could actually implement it. It was astonishing. Nobody had ever done that before, and best I can tell, nobody's ever done it since. Yeah, you see a lot of security requirements come out, and you look at them and you go, whoa, glad I didn't step on that. Um, <laughs> you caught me in a manic mode today. Yeah, that, that's OK. All right, so um, I was working at Sun Microsystems at the time. And we saw, you know, we got this specification, came out and looked at it and said, huh, we can do that. Why can we do that? Well, the good news is um, that there are a lot of features that this requires, and <laughs> Unix already has most of them. So we just kind of went, yeah, it's gonna, we're going to whip this, whip this puppy out in about six months, six, nine months, um, have, it all, have it out, and everybody's going to be happy. You know, government's going to buy billions of these. We're going to be, be filthy rich. We're going to all drive Ferraris. Um, but we do have to, have to make, make a few, a few uh, adjustments in order to make this, make this complete. Um, first, we've got to do some work on the access controls. All right. So access controls. How, how many of you understand what access control are? Yes. Ha okay, great. Actually, some of, some of you didn't raise your hands, which means you're not lying. Perfect. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, half the, I, I mean, half the programmers in the world today don't know how to use mode bits. Uh, this is frightening. Okay, but anyway, so for access control, we need, the, the Orange Book required two different kinds. Uh, discretionary, which means it's things you can share at will. It's like, I want to give you access to this file. I want to make sure that you can't read it. Um, it's up to you. They also had mandatory access control, which is based on system-defined policy. So you don't get to, to, to muck with that. The system makes a decision for you how th that data is controlled. And they added this other little, little tidbit here, which is like, oh, by the way, we want to keep track of the decisions that you make. That's actually a very important thing, okay? because that defines accountability. So now, if, if I set the mode bits on my file so that everybody can read it, and somebody who shouldn't be reading it is reading it, it's not their fault, it's my fault. All right? If I set the, set the mode bits so that you can't, can't read it, and you try to access it, and you fail, and you try to keep trying it every day yeah, for a week, we know that that happened, so we're going to take you aside and have a little bit of a discussion about your behavior, okay. because we can do that now, right? Very important concept. It wasn't there in Unix yet, but everybody saw that and said, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's going to be kind of painful to implement, but, but yeah, it, it does make a lot of sense. All right, so the discretionary access control was stuff we already had, mostly. Yeah, again, mostly. Um, so you have your user, you have users, and you have groups, and I'm not going to go into the details on multiple concurrent groups. Well, I will too. Um, multiple concurrent groups were implemented because there are cases where you want to have people from multiple groups look at something instead of just the one group. So the reason why this became, came to be an issue, oh, by the way, you log into your system with your user ID and password, and now it knows who you are. This is a very important thing for trackability, so we can come after you later if you're looking at things you shouldn't, shouldn't be uh, supposed to. So we started off with mode bits. Um, mode bits are actually a simplification of the basic concept of access control lists. Say, so rather than having, well, so we just define, say the owner gets the, this, these permissions, and then the, the group the owner's in gets these permissions, and everybody else get those, gets those. And that's really usually the way you want to deal with things. Me, us, them. That's the way people think. Me, us, them. Uh, but you know, the Orange Book did say we want to be able to specify access by discretion, you know, discretionary access at any granularity you might want. All right, so we have to bring access control lists back. 
not a problem, uh, really a fairly simple thing. You know? So we, we say this user has this access and this group has that access and we're all fine. Uh, well, but what about the mode bits now? So if I have an access control, it's, what do I do with the mode bits? Um, believe it or not, the initial proposal was that if you had an access control list, you used the access control list, period, in a sentence. Uh, if you had the mode bits, you used the you know, mode bits, but no access control list, you used the mode bits. Everybody would, everybody would have been happy. Their access control lists would have been very simple. But we were in an era of compatibility, and so we didn't do that. Uh, by the way, I was on a part of, member of the, the POSIX uh, 1003-1E2C group, which actually defined uh, a bunch of these security features, and they're actually in Linux today. So, which is one reason why this is relevant. Okay. So, backward compatibility is a real nuisance on occasion. Uh, one of the members of the team said, here's what we have to be able to do. Because we have programs do this all over the place. They do a stat, get the mode bits. They set the mode to zero so that nobody can access it. Then they go do stuff with it. And then they set the mode bits back. Okay? If you have an access control list, that behavior still needs to be supported. So chmod zero has to turn off access. And then chmod back to what it was before has to give you the exact same access you had before even if you have an access control list, because that's the way people write programs. Um, it would really be nice on occasion if we could change something rather than, rather than you know, put a layer on top of it, but that's not the way. So we ended up with this uh, interesting thing called a mask, where the group bits became the mask on the access control list. So if your group could do it, then anybody with an, with an explicit entry could do it. Otherwise, they can't. Um, in support of this, this one little, um, little use scenario here. This is, okay. this is a, a pattern that shows up from time, time to time as, we're, as we keep going here. Um, you start implementing more things to do more sophisticated things, but you also have to make them really convoluted in order to support the way things used to be, because nobody ever wants to rewrite code. Um, so then there's mandatory access control. Mandatory access control didn't exist on, on Unix systems at the time, uh, but it turned out to be really easy to implement. Um, and it's based on a clearance, you know, your clearance and the markings that are on a document. Um, and so this was actually based on a mathematical model that was done by the MITRE Corporation, a couple of guys named uh, Dave Bell and Len LaPodula. And they were given the exciting and uh, interesting task of taking the United States government rubber stamp policy. So if you took a red rubber stamp and said top secret on it, or uh, no foreign, or yeah, whatever other markings you put on it, and translate that into electronic form so they could put it, use it on computers. Well, it turned out that 80% of it was actually describable mathematically, and 20% of it was not describable mathematically. Um, which was turned out to be handy because they were that meant the, the really hard bit. They just said, "Okay, fine. We won't do that on computers. <laughs> <laughs> we won't mark things no foreign, you know, where no foreigner can access, or eyes only, or any of the other things that you can't actually support on a computer. You didn't have to. So that that was pretty cool. Uh, it had two components though. Um, one was a level." So you could be secret, top secret, unclassified, for example. And the other was categories. Now, a category would be things like, well, this is information about footy or information about cricket or netball or sevens. And if you're not cleared to see information about footy, like most Americans, um, you can't see it. You can't look at it. Um, and this turned out to be a very interesting model because it turns out almost every real world security uh, situation you want to implement, you can do using one of these two. Um, not all, but most of them. And you almost never have a situation where you're using both. So either you've got a hierarchy of information where you want some people to see some of it 
uh, but not all of it, and other people see all of it. Or you have a situation where you have, you want to just distribute it out. Um, we had one customer who uh, wanted to run a, uh, a supercomputer center. They had university undergraduates, an aircraft company, and the state weather service, all running on the same computer. Uh, they're not sharing any data. They're just working off by themselves uh, on their various things. And so everything was fine. You know, they could share the supercomputer. Yeah, nobody ever saw anybody else's data. There was another thing with a, a state weather service where uh, all the information was public. The fact that the, uh, their Air Force was using this information to look in places like Baghdad and uh, other places in the Middle East was something they didn't want everybody to know. So they used a strict hierarchy. Again, basic same data, but depending on what you're cleared for, you can see how it's processed. A very, very handy thing, kind of thing to do. Um, but people hated it. Nobody liked, liked Bell and Lepage. I could never figure out why, but that's okay. Um, and then, of course, there's audit. Um, the interesting thing about the Orange Book specification on the audit was that it was in direct conflict with the access control requirements. <laughs> in particular, the access control requirements required that you identify the, ex well, the, the access control requirements specified that you act on subjects and objects. So you have active entities and you have <coughs> passive entities, and the, the active entities act on the passive entities, and you had to, and it was the entity that you cared about. The audit required that you do things by path name. So you, if you're at all familiar with, the inter with you know, Linux file system internals, you know that an inode can have multiple names, and in fact, almost always does. When you open a file, you get a file descriptor. If you unlink that file, it file's still there. It just, the only name for it is this file descriptor. So from a modeling standpoint, you have one direction, and from the audit spe specification, you have a completely different direction. So this led to, to a lot of uh, very interesting implementations of audit trails. So how do you identify, you know, when, when somebody does an F chmod on a file that doesn't actually have a name anymore, what do you put in the audit record? Think about it, it's not pleasant. All right, so in addition to all that, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna the other features that they wanted to have uh, dealt with privilege. So what do you do in a system where anybody who is user ID zero has all power all the time. Uh, that's not good. That's not going to implement anything like what we call the principle of least privilege. How many of you have heard of that? Okay, it's always misapplied. What you, what, you, what you know about it is almost always wrong. Because really what the principle of least privilege says is you should have the privilege you need when you need it. You should, shouldn't have it when you don't need it. But this applies to the ability to violate policy. It's not a, just kind of the sweeping thing of, like, oh yeah, I shouldn't uh, have access to things, I shouldn't have access, don't need to have. It's, no, it's about when you can violate system policy. System policy is the key thing. And a lot of systems today don't have policy, so we don't, so you can't actually have privilege, so to have least privilege you have to do something else. I'm done with that rant now. All right, so the principle of least privilege shall be enforced is actually in the Orange Book, and they actually defined three roles, explicitly defined roles. The system administrator. Okay, on that laptop over there, who's the system administrator? You are? Cool. Why is he using it then? Okay, okay. Um, system operator. What is a system, okay, on that laptop, what's, what does the operator do? Um, and the security administrator. Well, that actually it makes a little bit of sense. I mean, like if you want to set up accounts on a laptop, that's a, a very reasonable thing for a security administrator to do. That's what your IT department does to you as opposed to <laughs> for you. Yeah, okay. So the idea here is that you're not going to have Superman you know, coming out of the phone booth. You're going to have this group of friendly people who are all there to help you, um, and they're going to work together like horses in a troika to uh, make sure that you get to where you need to be. That's a much more reasonable 
um, situation on a supercomputer again than, or a time sharing system than it is on your laptop. Um, but it kind of make, okay, it, it does make a lot of sense. Well, the way we actually approached this uh, system called capabilities. How many of you have used capab the ca capability system on your, on your Linux machine? Okay, how many of you would know how to set the file capabilities so that it will run with, a, with particular privileges? Okay, good, we've got one. Okay, that, that's all we needed to make my point. The point is that they're really pretty hard to use. Um, but the first thing about capabilities is the granularity. You know, people are always, asking, always going off about why is the granularity on capabilities so weird? The answer is actually very simple. Okay, the capabilities were originally defined, first off, only with regard to the things that were defined in POSIX. So if it was, if it was outside of POSIX, we couldn't actually define a capability. When we're actually dealing with the government on taking one of these systems through their evaluation process, they would say, we want your capabilities to match your system security policy. All right, so things like Chamad and uh, Chaon and, F and Shadur, okay, those, th you know, or Chirut, we have policy, we have capabilities for those because those are defined in our security policy. Things like mounting file systems and uh, shutting the system down, all these uh, setting ioctals so that your disks spin clockwise as opposed to windershins. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not as funny as it sounds. Uh, <laughs> um, that's that's not security policy, to which the, the response was, well, why do you have a capability for it then? It's like, well, because we have to control it somehow, and this is kind of, well, that's just administrative stuff. Yeah, we, we understand that, but we, we don't want to have too many mechanisms. So we have a capability which caps this admin because that's all the stuff that isn't actually in the security policy, but that was really important we protect. Well, okay, that's, that's fine. We have cap at, sysadmin, cap sys module. There are a couple of other thing, other poly capabilities we have that are, are massively uh, subscribed to um, that do a lot of things. And we're, we're continually, of course, getting requests for, oh, I want to have a capability that's the Windershins capability. I want cap disk Windershins. It's like, yeah, no, you're not going to get that. If we uh, expand it out, uh, even on a Unix system in, in uh, the late 1990s, one of the vendors had 320 capabilities. Who could keep track of 320 capabilities? I mean, if you could do that, you may as well write SC Linux policy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get back to you. Okay, so what are the capabilities of capabilities? Um, well, you can use them to, to drop and raise privilege. This is this wonderful notion that people had back in the day, which is that your program is going to run along, and when it needs, a, needs to have privilege, it's going to raise the privilege, use it, and then drop it again. All right, it's a great idea, right? I don't need a, yeah, most of the time I don't need a capability, so if something bad happens and I get tricked into do, doing something I really shouldn't do, I'm not going to have the capability to do it because I dropped it when I didn't need it, and everybody's going to be happy, right? There was exactly one attempt to take a major system service and, and re-implement it to do that. And that was send mail. And WUFCP Day. Who? WUFCP Day. They did that as well. Uh, original FCP Day, sorry. Okay. Well, that was, that's, that's recent. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, and it worked just fine, except that when you ran it as root, you could trick it into doing bad things because it was trying to drop capabilities, and then, but it couldn't drop capabilities because it didn't have capabilities because it was running its root, and it got really, really, really ugly. So nobody does that. Um, but the other thing we wanted to do is we want to set the capability set on a file. And that got to be um, really interesting because we wanted to do the same, same, ID, same thing as set UID root. Now, we could have just said, okay, here's a list of capabilities that when you run this program, it gets these capabilities. And we would have been done and everybody would be happy. Everybody would be running capabilities. Linux wouldn't have a, have a root user. Um, security would be ubi ubiquitous and we could all go home and not worry about things. But we got too fancy by a half. Um, so we said that you should have the effective set, which is the set you're actually having, the permitted set, which are the ones you can ask for, and the inheritable set, which are the ones that you can inherit when you do an exec. And we'll put file, 
capabilities on the file so that when you, you run that, we do this massive calculation based on what you have and what's on the file, and then whoosh, magic happens and you end up with a different capability set. Uh, unfortunately, the inheritable mechanism is completely broken. It doesn't work at all. Um, once you start specifying what you can and can't inherit, nothing ever works. Um, and it's only gotten worse because rather than saying, yeah, let's just throw the whole thing out and just go to the effective set that's on the file and, and we'll run that, um, we've introduced bounding sets um, we're, with uh, clusters, or sorry, with uh, um, containers. Thank you. Um, say, hey, if there's, a if there's a capability set on the file, I shouldn't, but I don't want to run with privilege there. Even in my container, I want to have a different file capability set for within my container. And so it just keeps getting more and more complex as people keep adding things like a bounding set in order to, to constrain what you, can, what you can have. So file capabilities are just ended up being too complicated, and I apologize. The other thing that, OK, we can get back to this thing about roles. It's a bad match on your laptop. Um, what we've gone, we've gone back to essentially that initial picture we had with the guy sitting in the room and, and with the guards out back, out back guarding things. Um, because it's your, mach your machine and you're doing all the administration on it, uh, doing roles doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Supercomputer still makes a little bit, but not that much, still not that much. So those are the features that the Orange Book talked about. But what really, really made the money was the assurance aspect of it. Okay. So one of the things that they really wanted to emphasize was the computer should, the computer should do what, it, what you wanted it to, and it shouldn't do anything else. Okay. And in fact, there were some people who were claiming that was, in fact, the definition of security. Um, this dog here, obviously, he does what he should. He's a good dog. <laughs> he's not going to do anything else. He's, he's a lab. <laughs> um, so the first part of this was validation. Let's go test things. In fact, let's test your design. Let's use formal methods if we can. Okay, we're going to analyze the source. Uh, we're going to look at the source. We're going to review it. We're going to, to read it. We're going to compare it with, with what's going on in, you know, in, in the industry. We're going to do source analysis. Okay. We're going to do object verification. We're going to run tools to make sure that the object code that you're running actually matches the source code that you, bit, that you wrote. Um, and then, of course, when all that's done, we're going to do penetration, penetration testing. So we're going to use the chicken gun here to, to, to shoot a frozen chicken at the, at the uh, jet engine blades. By the way, that's real. They really do shoot frozen chickens at jet engine blades. They use frozen chickens as well. It's a different, that's because they land planes in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but they also define process. Okay, so yeah, all this analysis is pointless if you don't keep track of what you've done. So the whole notion of you want to have an architecture, you got to have a design, you got to do you got to know how you're doing your development. How do you know that, that something sneaky didn't get in there? And how are you going to maintain it once it's in the field? Now, this is all stuff we know about today. But in 1985, nobody did this. 1985, nobody, um, well, people did write up their architecture, architectures, and then they wrote up their designs. And that was it. You know, they did their development. Um, everybody had their own, their own copy of things. Um, on Thursday, they'd gather up everything and put it on, on the, the, base, the end machine, make a golden image, and say, does this work? <laughs> yeah, it looks good. OK, great. And they'd ship it out. Maintenance? Yeah, well, you'll get the new gold image when we come up with it. So yeah, all the process stuff that they wanted to have was very novel. And all the computer system vendors who were go now working with this had to actually change the way they did things. So, um, Jonathan Corbett earlier today was talking about the source code control mechanisms that Linux uses, all derivative um, from this kind of from this process, the process requirements from the Orange Book that re, that that defined how it was 
you needed to do software development so you could actually say things about what you got, at the, got out the end. Um, that's great, right? This is the Bell XP-59. It was the American jet fighter that came out at the end of World War II. Uh, it had been developed with such secrecy that they couldn't find a wind tunnel anywhere in America that they trusted. As a result, it was all done by using 1920s aircraft design technology. So it could not keep up with an early World War II piston fighter. Um, even though it had yeah, two jet engines, uh, it, it, the problem we had with the Orange Book systems was exactly the same. In order to meet all the government requirements in order to produce a system that they, they liked, it cost us a million dollars a year and it took five years to complete this, the process. So it was obsolete by the time it shipped. Um, but when it did ship, we had all the problems solved. We had solved computer security. It was great. It was wonderful. And then uh, we hit the great crossroad. The day before Sun Microsystems announced their Orange Book system, the Morris worm hit. All of a sudden, things were different. What changed was the adversary. Okay? Instead of the adversary being the guy at the next terminal, somebody who you could look in the audit trail to find out what he had done, it became the code he was running or the code somebody was running. You had no idea where this code came from. Uh, this code became the adversary. It's no, you know, keeping track of the person who, who ran it was no longer the issue. I don't care you know, if Russell over here started this program. This program is what I'm, what I'm really concerned about. I was like, he, he didn't know that it was there. He just you know, he typed, typed in a command name to see what would happen, and boom, all of a sudden, my data got destroyed. All right, the adversary became the computer itself, became the programs itself. It took a while for this to sink in. It took a long time for this to sink in. Um, but it never would have happened if we didn't have distributed computing. Okay, now, way back then, it's like, there was this thing called the net, there was the network, and thing, people were starting to call it the internet. Um, but it really was just computers hooked up by modems to talk to each other. Um, so it was distributed computing. And golly bum, they started off all wrong. Okay? Started off with the internet protocols. What's wrong with the internet protocols? I hear you cry. Well, first off, they're intentionally insecure. Uh, there is no security information. There is no security information in the internet protocol. You can say checksums and all that other, other la di da di da. That's not security information. That's there to make it so that the hardware can run fast. Um, and it's carrier com pigeon compatible, which means that you're actually sending as little information as you possibly can as infrequently as you possibly can in order to get the job done. Because at the time, yeah, it was kind of slow. OK, it was really slow. Um, Carrier pigeons were not actually an improvement, but they weren't that much of a degradation either. Uh, but the security aspect of the internet was very strictly, if you've got a program and it's cocking on a socket, it's your responsibility to make a determination about what's on the other end. So the intention was that every program that talked on the network was going to do all kinds of authentication and identify who's on the other end, make sure that it's the right program on the other end, right? For all these other, other kinds of things, you, you were essentially intended, expected to create protocols for your applications um, that would take care of that for you. And you were left on your own to do it. And of course, nobody did it. Okay. Um, at about that time along comes Linux. Yay! Yay, rapidly popular. It's rapidly popular with the uh, security people because they could do, <clears throat> it became the darling of, of secure systems because the proprietary systems we knew were too expensive. Um, we had all the experience, so we could all just do all these things. And we could fix mandatory access control that nobody liked. Um, 
we did that uh, several different ways. SC Linux, um, which was based on domain type enforcement from the Flask project. Uh, SMAC, which was the third generation implementation of Bell and LaPodula um, from the Silicon Graphics system, uh, but generalized based on the notion, well, SC Linux based on type enforcement and uh, all kinds of interesting and, and uh, well, interesting transitions between um, security information. SMAC is more oriented toward, let's just give things a, things a label and we'll define how these labels interact with each other. Um, and AppArmor, AppArmor App Armor was an implementation of the access control system that the audit requirement had with the path names. So it actually made more sense to, to, to uh, write your, your security rules based on the path names than on the inode numbers. Yeah, it kind of makes a little bit of sense. Uh, but the big important thing here is the granularity. Okay. If the, or if the uh, Bell and Lepodula system had granularity of bricks, SC Linux has the granularity of sand. Which is great if you really want get, to get to that level of granularity, but which would you rather build a wall with? Okay, so now we've got these security systems, we've got them in place, and let's bring in the rabble. Because now we've got, we've got the network speeding up so that it's actually, we can actually use it. Uh, we've got systems that have got a relatively reasonable set of security on them. And the rabble's gonna come in, and what's going to lead the rabble on distributed systems, which we're now calling the internet? Well, what's always been the first thing to make money? Pornography. Yeah. This is important because pornography has two characteristics that, or this, the distribution of pornography has two characteristics that are fundamental to doing business. The first of which is payment, and the second of which is privacy. Because nobody wants, you know, when you're running for office, nobody wants, wants it known how much money you spent on the pornography over the past five years. Uh, once all those problems were solved, we got the World Wide Web, which is just a generalization of the distribu distribution of pornography. <laughs> <laughs> and that meant there's money for everybody, right? So we had the dot-com boom, where everybody was doing a website to sell dog food, um, sock puppets, um, shoes, anything you could think of. Somebody had a, had a website for it. And boom, money for everything. So we had the dot-com boom, and then we had the dot-com bust, where it turned out you really only needed Amazon. But since everybody was going to make money on, on the internet, we, had ra we introduced rapid development. Uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with the uh, the manifesto for agile software development, but what it does is it says, yeah, all that stuff the Orange Book told us about the development process, yeah, we don't like that. We're gonna do different uh, because it's too slow. Uh, okay, well, so that meant that validation, it's like, let's just do fuzz testing. We're not gonna write test cases, good God, that's too hard. We've got a program here, it'll just throw random, random stuff at the program and if it, and until it falls over. And we'll fix that, and then we'll call it good. Uh, that take a whole lot less time. Um, yeah, as far as code review, yeah, we're just going to have some automated tools. Any, <clears throat> yeah, we, we've got automated tools. We've got Coverity. We've got Clockwork. We're going to run them on the on the code and call it good. Uh, maybe we're going to have if if we're really careful about it, yeah, we'll use use something so that like Garrett, we'll we'll do code review. We'll require a code. Somebody say they've done a code review before we check it in, but yeah, it's just a, a little tool here. We'll fix everything with tools. Um, and then if there's a security problem, no problem. We're just gonna take the code we've got, we're gonna wrap it in a fuzzy blanket. Um, that's the general way SE Linux uh, and AppArmor work, is they say, oh, well, we've got this program here. Uh, we think that this is the stuff it should do, so anything that isn't that stuff uh, we're gonna say, we're gonna make fail. All right, fine. Um, personally, I'd rather people fix their programs than write the, wrap them in fuzzy blankets, but that's just me, I'm old. Uh, then we, 
Okay, so now we've got systems running here. We're going to introduce things like systemd, uh, where you can set any attribute that you want on the service you're going to run. So you don't have to worry about whether the program does anything rational or not. Uh, because I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to give it these capabilities, or I'm going to get, run it with this SE Linux context, or whatever, and it's going to run, and since I've set it up so that I've constrained what it can do, it'll be, it'll be safe, because, uh, because it'll be safe, because I've set the attributes properly. Well, then we brought up containers, hoo hoo, the ultimate fuzzy blanket. <laughs> We're going to lie about the environment. I'm going to tell, yeah, you can run your system, system here in a container and it's not really running with privilege and it's not really uh, running on the system. It's just, we're just lied, lied to you about it. And then if it screws up, well, it just screws up in the container, right? You can't get out of a container, right? Yeah. So here we are, <laughs> sitting on the porch in our old armor with our laser rifle. And it gets better because we're at, we're, we're at a major major, another major junction here where we're going to start giving software the ability to do things physically. We're going to start having it drive cars. Uh, in 1972, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System in San Francisco uh, had con computer con the first computer-controlled railway system in the, in the world. And they're, they were testing it out. It was working perfectly until they put a cracked crystal in one of the boards. And time meant something different. And so the, the software did exactly what it was supposed to do. Ran the, car, ran the train right off the track because it was, wasn't supposed to stop for another five minutes. Oops. Okay. This is something that we need to be wear, <coughs> very wary of with our, with our uh, software going forward is we're giving it bigger, bigger things to play with. Uh, so we have to get to a point where we're, giving, we're dealing with software with some level of intelligence. Um, natural would be nice. I mean, if we could get people to actually treat their software intelligently, that would be a big step in the right direction. Um, but we, we may have to settle for artificial because, as we see here, if um, your opponent has a lot more sophistication than you do, you're probably going to lose the game. Who here believes that there is no artificially intelligent hacking software available today? Good, right answer, yes. Of course there is. How much artificially intelligent defensive software do we have? Yes, yeah, yeah, somebody's here going, yeah, well, maybe, yeah, yeah. But it's all proprietary, it's all being, well, good. Not, there isn't enough of it, okay. All right, so let's talk about the future now. All right. How many of you read science fiction? Okay, how many of you remember a guy named Isaac Asimov? He used to write science fiction. He, does, he doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> okay, he came up with three laws of robotics. Okay, I'm not going to read them here. They're too, they're too long. You all know them anyway. Um, but they won't work. They're too subjective. Okay, we can, do, we can do something similar though. We can have a secure robot as opposed to the, the one that you would trust with your life, okay. Uh, but this is just back to the Orange Book rules restated. You're gonna say a robot must be able to identify his master. If you can't identify where you're getting your, getting your instructions, then you're just running amok. Um, you have to obey the, the, <laughs> the orders of your master or you're just running amok. And we'll give you the option to, to obey the orders of others too, if they're consistent with what your master had said. And a robot's gotta keep track of what, he, what decisions it's made so that when he does run amok, we can go look and see what it was that he did, who told him to do this, so that we can take the person and send them to jail rather than the robot, because sending the robot to jail is a really kind of a pointless activity. <laughs> okay, and finally, it's time for computers to look out for themselves. They're going to have to. Um, imagine the intelligent, uh, ca the car that's intelligent enough to drive you from your house to your work. Imagine that that car has enough intelligence to do that, but doesn't have enough intelligence to figure out that it doesn't want to do that. That's stupid. Okay. 
Um, computers need to be careful out there. They need to be a lot more careful than they are now. The adversaries are there. The risks are there. The other cars are there. Um, the trains are there. I, they they got to get smarter about security, about safety, about privacy. Uh, and we're not always going to be there to direct them when they, when they make a mistake. Uh, they're going to be doing autonomous things. They're going to be doing a lot of autonomous things. So they need to, to gain that intelligence. So I just got told to stop. I'm out of time. It's even got an exclamation point. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. Uh, I'll be here all week.